So imagine if uh, pristine ecosystems could be infused with smart sensors to detect invasive species that threaten native biodiversity. Or if our everyday mobile phones would help us develop healthier and more sustainable daily habits just as they now alert us to traffic jams. Well, these and many other critical issues facing science, government, business, and the public call for high fidelity and real-time sensing of both natural and built environments. This uh, embedded internet, or World 2.0, uh, complements the internet of information and things by supporting more efficient resource usage and increased visibility into the impacts of our daily actions and choices. So this final session really builds on the excellent presentations earlier in the day because the internet, the web, machine learning algorithms, computational models are all the foundational technologies that have brought computing everywhere. And by everywhere, we really mean every sector of our economy, every epoch of our lives, episode of our day, every role we play, citizens, consumers, employees, patients, parents. And so we'll focus in particular on how computing extends beyond the processing and sharing of knowledge embedded in text and numbers to direct measurement, management, and manipulation of physical phenomenon. So uh, not just because Jim Collins is here, let me start with an example of uh, the role of sensing in the management of ecosystems, which are changing rapidly in response to climate change and human activities. Timely information about their structure and function and the services they provide is vital to conservation of habitat biodiversity and mitigation of the effects of urbanization. However, ecosystems are complex and dynamic. You think the human body is difficult to understand and study. Ecosystems are uh, even more so. They exhibit tremendous spatial variation and to understand them requires simultaneous measurement of a wide range of physical, chemical, and biological parameters both above and below ground. Remote sensing from satellites in orbit above the Earth, oops, I was meant to stay there for a moment, um, provides sense data that has transformed our understanding of environmental and urban processes. However, every pixel in an image, as I show here, taken from a satellite represents the average value over many meters, often over many kilometers. And so when it comes to biological phenomena or processes that happen within a pixel, remote sensing alone can't answer these questions. Well, fortunately, miniaturization, Moore's Law, enable us to combine sensing, computation, and wireless communication in integrated devices that can be placed in situ and up close to physical phenomenon. And so across a wide array of applications, this ability to observe these physical processes with, with high spatial and temporal fidelity can now allow us to create models and make predictions and thereby manage our increasingly stressed physical world. So therefore, we really need observing systems that collect large-scale, ground-based, and high spatial resolution measurements. And these new observatories, uh, such as NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, and the Ocean Observing Init Initiative, are really excellent examples of this new approach, and both are enabled by information technology and sensing. So sensing. Sensors are really the components that actually measure the ecosystem drivers and responses. So from things as simple as temperature to the more challenging chemical species, such as nitrate, and ultimately biological parameters as well. However, we have a problem in these distributed sensing systems, which is transducers that make up those sensors develop far more slowly than the computing platforms. And so, and in particular, biological sensors are really the most challenging of our sensors to develop. And so, while advances in new sensor technologies are essential in the long term and demand serious investment, fusion of available sensor data streams with one another and with computational models and clever interpretation and mining of those data are key to drawing important inferences from raw measurements that we can take now. So, for example, consider the many important biological responses in an ecosystem that can be observed in the optical domain, really as people do now on a manual basis through visual observations. Wireless imaging devices, you know, basically smart webcams, can act as biological sensors for species distribution, timing of leafing and flowering, vegetative health and disease, and even evidence of photosynthesis or calibration of carbon cycle models. So as we saw in the previous talk, imaging plays a key role and automated imaging plays a key role in the interpretation of these uh, sensor streams. And so the concept is, is really uh, enabled 
on the one hand by the great advances in digital imager hardware devices, and on the other hand by the great advances in computer vision algorithms that are used to automatically interpret those images. And so just to give you a really simple and intentionally simple example, uh, here we've been collecting daily images from about 1,600 freely available pre-existing internet connected uh, webcams that are distributed across the continental U.S. These are cameras that happen to be pointing to patches of vegetation. They're owned by USGS or Park Service or Highway Services. And we just automatically grab images uh, off of those webcams and automatically quantify the greenness levels in those images on a daily basis to start to look for uh, quantified indications of how blossom, patterns of blossoming in the onset of spring are changing as weather pattern change in particular microclimates. And as it turns out, just simple greenness measurements appear, appear to be quite comparable to those uh, remote sensing products that I showed you a picture of earlier, and yet they provide a spatial resolution that's orders of magnitude finer than what you would see from a remote sensing image, because each of these cameras is finely trained on what is clearly uh, just more like a square meter instead of uh, uh, square kilometers. So that just simple example of how to use imager-based sensing combined with uh, it, it, more complex image processing and computer vision algorithms give you to a sense of how as even with our existing transducers we can start to move sensing uh, everywhere throughout our, uh, our uh, issues of scientific and, and civic concern. Another way of sort of spinning that use of imagers as biological sensors is captured by my, my favorite uh, nerd bumper sticker, which is that if you can't go to the field with the sensor you want, uh, go with the sensor you have. Those of you in this town might recognize that riff. Um, and a few years ago, building on that notion of opportunistic sensing, which started by using imagers as our only really available biological, uh, widely deployable biological sensor for ecosystems, uh, we began considering the opportunity to leverage what is really that most widely proliferated of wireless sensor, which is that mobile phone. And as we know, market forces have led to the adoption of mobile phones across all demographics and across geography. It's created a global wireless network with which individual observations can be managed and shared. And these mobile phones offer really an unprecedented tool with which to observe the world at a personal scale. By capturing and uploading it, images, text, audio, and most importantly, by automatically uh, associating those, uh, those, all those data types with location and time through the use of embedded GPS in, in those smartphones. And so the opportunities that you have by a world full of data collectors is then even further enhanced by the fact that it's quite easy to task and program and retask and reprogram these distributed devices and the increasing usability and sophistication of web-based geospatial analysis tools, Google Earth and others, and all sorts of mashup tools by which you can make coherent sense of that collection of data. And one of the most exciting aspects of this focus on mobile phones as, as sensors in that way is really the range of applications that are supportable and the tremendous scalability and affordability. This is really the technology I th above all others that's bringing sensing into everyday life. So staying with ecosystems for the moment, mobile phones extend that vision of leveraging distributed imaging uh, and they do it even further, this time in the form of geocoded, coordinated image capture from everyday citizens. And so, if you think about that satellite image again, we were getting higher resolution by making use of those webcams across America, but now for each satellite camera in the sky, really there are millions of mobile phones on the ground, and many of them have cameras of their own, high resolution cameras. And so for every pixel in a satellite image, there are potentially hundreds of human eyes that can refute or refine what's actually happening on the ground. And so with Conservation International, we're working to develop uh, climate change knowledge networks in ecologically important regions by engaging individuals and communities in systematic data collection and knowledge dissemination using mobile phones. So moving on now from ecosystems to more directly human systems, we can similarly consider 
all the concerns and costs in our uh, personal and human health care system that relate to avoiding, managing, mitigating uh, chronic conditions and diseases. And so whether it's about understanding the precise environmental drivers of exposure and behavior, some of which you heard about in the previous, uh, in the previous session, or whether it's about managing interventions, measuring symptoms and side effects, uh, supporting individual and independent living through, through personalized uh, disease management, the mobile to web infrastructure offers tremendous opportunities for diffusion of really affordable personalized health care. And that begins with the capture of personalized activity measurements on an individual's mobile device. So for health applications in particular, mobile phones can be programmed to provide high resolution location time series data. And that location time series data can be automatically uploaded in real time and automatically activity annotated. And then, via powerful web services, that activity time location series can be used to draw a wide array of inferences regarding exposure to health risks, regarding habitual health patterns, uh, patient reported outcomes, and all uh, manner of issues related to quality of life. And so these always on and always worn devices represent really the first broadly available and affordable technology to provide individualized location and activity-based observation in a manner that scales to very significant populations. We like to think of it as a sort of an individual's living record that's there and that can enhance their electronic health record. Now, that resulting personal data stream are really of qualitatively higher resolution and validity when you compare it to the old forms of retrospective uh, self-report. These data can be fed into multi-scale models and analyses, and those can further transform those individual measurements into meaningful findings for things like epidemiology as well. They can also be used, as I have here on the slide, as the basis of personalized health management and intervention, targeting things like diet, such as you see here, or other health behaviors, such as medication adherence. And while this capability raises essential issues about privacy, uh, if done right, with secure, fine grain and transparent information flow control and audit, the capabilities could transform the way we manage our health. So the same uh, mobile to web technology can also help individuals manage sustainable changes towards environmental, not just personal health. Uh, our personal environmental impact report uh, which we call PEER and which Jeff Burke will exhibit uh, in this afternoon's uh, reception, uses that same personal location time series, that same location trace from a mobile phone, to estimate, in this case, personal carbon impact and exposure to air particulates. So just as your Prius dashboard gives you real-time feedback on your driving behavior related to fueling efficiency and correlates those two with, for you, the combination of personal data and models can now reveal how daily patterns interact with the environment, and that feedback can inform personally and globally sustainable choices. In this slide, I'm just illustrating how one of the four models we implement is, is, is uh, processed where your location trace is activity classified and then used to, uh, to estimate those environmental uh, exposure parameters, in particular in this slide, as it relates to uh, black carbon air particulates. So these uh, location traces bring me back to the issue of privacy. Uh, at the core of these applications is this notion of this personal data stream. And, and over time, these activity location traces, combined with the wealth of, of geospatial information available on the web, provides a body of mineable data about an individual's life that is truly unprecedented. And reviewing our own data through simple map interfaces, such as what you see up here, quickly brought to light more than a few situations in which we wouldn't even want people we trust to see our raw location traces. I can tell you some stories later. Uh, but probably more important than that notion of a sense of personal boundaries is that these, uh, this form of an archive about your detailed location history could lead to serious forms of systematic discrimination. It could, it could Maybe health insurers penalize you for spending large amounts of time in neighborhoods with bad air quality or high concentrations of fast food merchants. We now have GINA to protect us from genetic discrimination. Do we need a sister legislation to protect us from discrimination resulting from our history of location traces and inferred environmental exposures? We are purposefully designing our systems uh, to explore um, just some examples of headlines from people starting to leverage those location traces in some ways that make you think twice. So 
We're purposely designing our system, such as PEER that I mentioned and you can see later, to explore and mitigate some of those concerns about location privacy. Uh, the current PEER system keeps all location traces uh, private only to the person who actually recorded the data, you log in with password, and you see your raw location. But because people want to share and compare their PEER experiences and how they're doing and going greener, we enabled automatic sharing of aggregated data. So the screenshot on your right shows um, the peer extension that connects with Facebook, and so we drive a Facebook widget that's not based on the details of your trace, but aggregate statistics. More generally, as these services emerge and proliferate, there are big open questions. You know, how can systems that capture and share data at an unprecedented granularity and scale practically address privacy concerns while retaining their intended value. To address this, we've started to develop the concept of a private data vault, where the vault and technically instantiated filters try to give you granular assisted control over what you send to whom, what that data says about you, whether you reveal who you are, share it anonymously, and so forth. And SENS is addressing privacy in this context as alongside as we build these innovative applications of mobile sensing. We're addressing privacy because we think it's the right thing to do and because location privacy is actually a very interesting uh, research trajectory from a computer science perspective. But one of the reasons I, I point this out is that one of the um, reasons that it's so essential to maintain a healthy investment in publicly funded technology research is so that these sorts of issues of public good, which can't always be the primary drivers in a commercial enterprise, can shape our technology, not to prevent commercialization, not to prevent privatization, but rather to promote how the market operates in a form that addresses externalities, things like open interfaces and privacy-preserving architectures. So, to sum up, uh, computing is everywhere, and with physical computing that leverages sensing, we can begin to create programmable observatories of the physical world to address compelling environmental, community, and personal concerns. And these innovative sensing systems can reveal the previously unobservable, and in so doing, really help us understand and manage our interactions with the physical world, with scarce resources, and with one another. And so finally, none of what my colleagues and I have been able to contribute to this vision would have happened without the financial support of the National Science Foundation and earlier DARPA. And we tr clearly need, as a country and as a planet, to sustain and grow the innovative multidisciplinary research environments that manage to bring together faculty from across many disciplines and nourish our students to come together and innovate in matters of great importance and in a manner that has real impact. Thank you.